And the title of today's message, if you will, is It's More Than a Bath. Because, see, here's the thing. If you don't give your life to Jesus before you get baptized in water, then it's basically just a bath with no soap. If you go down the water a sinner, you're going to come up a sinner. Amen? There are a lot of denominations that teach that water baptism is what saves you. And I'm here to tell you that it is faith in Jesus Christ. It says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Is everything okay? All right. Good. You will be saved. Romans 10, 9, and 10. So we are not saved by being dipped in water. However, Jesus set a few what we call ordinances. Okay, it's kind of a complicated word that simply means a ritual. Something that Jesus put in. See, there's a difference between rituals that man makes up and rituals that Jesus put in place. Now, there are several rituals identified with Jesus. A couple of them we did last week. One of them was communion. And if you remember with communion, here is what we talked about with communion. Communion is a representation of the sacrifice that Jesus made. He shed his blood and his body was broken so that we could be forgiven of sin. And when we partake in communion, it is a declaration of exclusivity that I belong to Jesus and he belongs to me. I forsake all other gods and everything else takes second place in my life. That is quite a declaration to make. That's why the Bible says if you eat and drink communion unworthily, you're eating and drinking damnation to yourself. Because if you eat and drink communion while there's all these other plethora of gods, and you may say, well, I don't bow down to these Asherah poles and these totem poles and all these. Yeah, but you may bow down to the television. You may bow down to that video game system. Amen. That it keeps you dysfunctional and it keeps you from being able to do the things that God calls you to do. You may bow down to your books. Amen. You may bow down to your car, or your job, or some actor, or some sports team. And I surely hope that sports isn't your God, because it's awful this year, at least for a L fan. <laughs> it's terrible. But there are a lot of things that we allow cost against our relationship with God. Does that make sense? It hinders our relationship with God. There's things we could be doing for God, but there's this thing that sits on the throne with him right? There's this thing that we allow in our relationship with him. And in the Bible and the Old Testament, one of the mistakes that the Old Testament saints made over and over and over again was they allowed other gods in with their worship. And this infuriated God because as we talked about last week, he's a jealous God. He's not jealous in the sense that you have this and I want it. He's jealous in the sense like a husband who wants exclusive rights to his wife. I don't think that's an unreasonable jealousy, right? God wants exclusive rights to his creation. He wants our adoration alone, and then he wants to pour his love out on us alone. So that's kind of what communion represents. It represents a sacrifice that Jesus made that makes us worthy. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from our sins. It's the body of Jesus broken and beaten so that we can become healed and whole. Not just mentally, not just spiritually, but physically. Jesus purchased our entire salvation. And that's something we taught last week with the whole enchilada. We have no food for you this week unless you're lucky enough to get ice cream after church. Sorry. (laughs) But when I think about what communion means, and then we transition into what baptism means, communion represents the sacrifice of God, while baptism represents the effects of that sacrifice. It's a changed life. It represents a new person. And again, Jesus said in Luke chapter 22 regarding communion, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus gave a command for the church to partake in communion. Now, you may partake in communion at your home and various things, but it's not the same. When the church comes together, there is a holiness and a reverence and an awe when we come together to participate in the ordinances. Some people call them the sacraments. I can work with that, too. It basically means the same thing. Now, another one that we do, um, we don't do as often, is baby dedications. Now, a lot of times in many denominations, these baby dedications include some sort of baptism where they sprinkle the baby. Now, this is not the same kind of baptism I'm talking about today. You do not get baptized in an infant, and then you're, you're, you don't get baptized as a believer. Baptism is for believers. We'll get to that in a minute. But that's in order because Jesus was dedicated unto God. 
Amen. And whatever formula and format you use, there's no biblical rule on how to dedicate children. If they want to sprinkle them as an act of dedication and say, one day this child's going to get baptized in water, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. When I have the problem is when they think that takes the place of believers' baptisms. And then that's when I have an issue with it because that child is not capable of believing. And then the other ordinance, of course, we're talking about today, and that is water baptism. Now, we know that John the Baptist baptized people unto repentance. And we know that John the Baptist baptized Jesus. So Jesus kind of set the example with his own life by being baptized in water. But then Jesus left us with this command. Remember, he commanded, as often as you drink this bread and eat this cup, or I'm sorry, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death, so I come. Do this in remembrance of me. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. So where does Jesus command baptism? Because folks, if Jesus commanded us to do it, it's not optional. Thank you, Tim Jones. I said, if Jesus commands us to do it, it is not optional. Amen? It is a command. So now, let's find out where this command comes from. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. A lot of people skip verse 18. I don't for a reason, because Jesus makes a statement that tells you why he can give commands. You ready? It says in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. So Jesus is saying, now that I have accomplished the work of some people call it the Eucharist, some people call it communion, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we call it communion here. Now that I have accomplished the first sacrament, I'm about to implement the second one, and that is baptism in water. Now, don't get it reversed. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. But he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I've been given all authority. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I've given you, and be sure of this, I am always with you, even to the end of the age. So Jesus gives the church some responsibilities here, some commands. Because remember, it says, teach these new disciples to obey all commands I've given you. So see, we have this soft version of Jesus that's full of grace and full of Oh, I just love people, and I just can't stand to see them hurting. So if you don't want to do what I say, that's okay. And that's not the way Jesus said. Jesus said, commands. Jesus said, these are my commandments that you love one another. If you love me, obey my commandments. Jesus gives commands. Jesus is not a softened version of the Father. They are the same God. Are you hearing me? Jesus gives commands. He said, teach them to obey the commandments I have given you. And one of the commandments was to go and make disciples, preach the gospel. See, these are commands that Jesus gave the church. There are about 500 people here at this time, which made up the New Testament church. They had not yet been baptized in the Holy Spirit. They had been told to wait. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. They had been told to wait until the power of God fell on the day of Pentecost. Of course, they weren't specifically given that day. But he gives them the command to go and preach the gospel. Go and make disciples. Go and make believers. Then it says baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So first we preach and they get saved. Second, we baptize them. Third, we teach. Amen. Amen. Preach, baptize, teach. Teach these disciples, these new disciples, to obey all the commandments I've given you. Whose responsibility is it to teach? It is the churches. It's not just the teachers. There is an office of teacher, but it does not excuse us all of our responsibility to teach new believers to obey. Amen? I thank God for the office of teachers. We have some of the best teachers I know that go to church here. But ultimately, the church has the responsibility to preach, make disciples, baptize, and teach these disciples to obey the commands. And then we have the promise of his presence. It is not a dry, stale, empty religion. We have the promise of presence. Can you imagine how boring communion would be without the presence of God? Because let me, let, let's be honest, the, the wafer cracker, whatever you call it, it's not that good. Matter of fact, if you can get it down, you're dying for grape juice, which you get like a sip. Right? We know it's more than just these elements. Just like baptism in water. We take a bath on a regular basis. At least some of us do by the smell of the building. Um, and it doesn't really change anything until 
there's change in us, the presence of God. See, because the Bible gives a promise to every believer. It says that his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are his children. So that means that when we give our lives to Jesus, his spirit now lives within us as a witness of our salvation, as a witness of our changed life. Are you hearing me? So that's what changes everything, and that's what separates Christianity from other religions. Many other religions, there is this dream or this goal we're trying to achieve, and there's this God that's beating us down every time we make a mistake. But in Christianity, we have this God that's helping us up and overcome our mistakes and become greater than our mistakes and to even get to the points where we don't make the same mistakes over and over again. So church ordinances that we do were actually instituted by Jesus himself. These are not meaningless traditions, simply keeping a religious rule. They're actually symbols that have deep spiritual meaning. And toward the end of this message, I'm going to kind of tell you, what is the meaning of water baptism? We know the command. And I'm going to give you some examples and patterns in the scripture that I believe show how we're supposed to get baptized in water. However, what does it mean? What does it really mean to go down in that water and come back up wet? Is that, is that it? It's deeper, and it means far more than that. Now, first things I want to say is we are led by the Spirit, not ordinances. If we become an ordinance-led church, then we're going to dry up and die. However, there are Spirit-led ordinances. Amen? Clearly ruled out in the Scripture, pointed out to us. Communion and baptism being among those. Communion is not optional. It is a command. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. I actually feel the church should probably do it more often. It's one of those things that I don't know how we got down to once a month, but it's just kind of been a tradition ever since I've been saved. And uh, I almost think it's something we should do every time we come together. And actually, way, 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 way back in the day when the church first started, it was still a Passover meal. And they went for the whole lamb and the whole nine. Y'all want to talk about coming? This church would be packed. If we did that, and they actually had a problem because people were coming just to eat, just because they were hungry. It wasn't because they recognized what Jesus had done for them. So out of risk of keeping going back and forth, I'm going to move on to what I really want to get into today. And that is, remember this, when the Holy Spirit draws us to Christ and transforms us, it leads us to Jesus who leads us to the Father. The whole goal is to serve the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. And see, I say this because there's something that aggravates me about Pentecostal people. I don't have to listen to you because I have to listen to the Spirit. Well, well the thing is, if that's the case, then it better agree with Jesus, and it better agree with the Father. Are you hearing me? Because you can't say I'm following the Spirit and disobey Jesus. Yeah. It's not possible. You can't say I'm going to the Father and disobey Jesus. You can't get to either of them if you disobey the Spirit. Amen? They all three work together as one God. Manifest in three persons. It's a beautiful mystery, but yet understandable at the same time. I say this because the work of the Spirit that transforms you into a child of God and immediately saves you and leads you to Jesus, who then in turn leads you into a relationship with the Father. That's why I struggle with someone who says, well, I'm saved, Pastor, but I don't want to be baptized. So that leads to a conflict in me because that's someone that's saying, I'm saved, but I want to disobey Jesus. Right? Right? I'm saved, but I want to disobey Jesus. Now, look, I want to, I'm going to get ahead of myself, and I don't care because I do it all the time. Uh, that does not mean that we can't arrange things where your family comes, and it may take a little time to get that situated. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a person that says, no, I don't want to get baptized because it's embarrassing. I don't like the way I look wet. I don't want to get baptized because I don't think it really matters because baptism isn't what saves me. No, baptism, it's faith that saves you, but it's obedience that is the fruit of salvation. Amen. Are you hearing me? When we don't walk in obedience and we're walking in disobedience, I think there's a problem with a disobedient Christian. I think those two words don't work together. 
Christians are obedient to Jesus. Why? Because they are led by the Spirit. And then ultimately, if we disobey Jesus, we got the Father to deal with. I want to deal with my Father on good terms. Amen? And we have the Spirit empowering us. It's not like we're on our own. It's not like we have to figure this all out. He lives inside of us, moving and breathing within us, guiding us, directing us, giving us purpose and courage to do the things that we need to do. It's not like we're orphans. Jesus said, I'll not leave you as orphans. I'm going to send you a comforter, and he's going to teach you everything that I've just taught you. He said, whenever you get under attack and you don't know what to do, don't worry about what to say. The Spirit of God will speak through you. The Spirit is powerful. So what about baptism? What's the pattern? Because, again, there are some people that say, well, you just sprinkle the person. There are some people that say, well, you can get baptized as a baby. And there are some people that say, well, the formula doesn't really matter as long as it's in, done in faith. However, I think when, a scripture, when the Scripture sets a pattern, as long as we're able to follow that pattern, we should. Yeah. Now, we know that sometimes there are people with handicaps. Like, there was a time, um, I lived in Burksville, Kentucky, and there was a man that was in a wheelchair. And he wanted to get baptized in water. And he was a pretty big guy. And I mean, it wasn't like we were going to just lift this wheelchair and him into this baptistry. It would, have, it would have nearly killed us. So we got this big pitcher of water. We put a tarp down. And we just doused that dude. You know, and he got completely soaked. And does it follow the scriptural pattern perfectly? No, but I believe that's a situation to where we can adjust things to meet that person where they are. And uh, I don't know if God ever healed him or not. But once he gets healed, get out of the wheelchair, then we'll do it right. Amen. But meanwhile, I don't want to deprive someone of obeying Jesus without uh, the opportunity to try to modify it and see if we can help them. But when it comes to a scriptural pattern of baptism, I'm going to give you a few quick ones, and then I'm going to share a story, and then we're going to go baptize some of these new believers. The first thing is it seems to always immediately follow salvation. Uh, in Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 40, there's a eunuch that is an Ethiopian. And I'm not going to go to the text because it's a little lengthy. But basically, Philip is an evangelist, and he's preaching, and he's uh, going about his merry way. And he meets this uh, eunuch on the road, and this eunuch is reading the scripture. He's reading the scroll of Isaiah. And the guy says, hey, hey, sir, is this, is this talking about someone that's to come, or is it talking about another person? Who's this talking about? So then it says he takes them from the beginning of the Bible and walks him through the story of Jesus from Genesis all the way to that point, preaches the gospel to him. And then it says the, the Ethiopian eunuch looks and says, oh, look, there's some water. What would prevent me from getting baptized? It says, and Philip and the eunuch both went down in the water and came up. Amen. Okay, now hang on to that because that's important as well. All right, but it seems to always be immediate. Now let me give you another example. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, the church had just started. Peter preached the best sermon probably ever preached. And it says, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. It says that day. Amen? Now, I think it's interesting because it gives us an order here. First they believed, then they were baptized. Baptizing someone who does not believe does not make any sense. Okay, it is a believer's baptism. And I'm going to tell you why here toward the end. It says, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day. The same day, about 3,000 in all. 3,000 people, the same day they got saved, they got baptized. Now, again, we understand we try to work things logistically. So mamas and papas and brothers and uncles and all these people can come. And when we understand that it's about a heart that's willing to obey Jesus. Once they get saved, they make the commitment to get baptized, particularly that day usually. And then we get the waters going. And by the way, the water is warm today, praise God, for the first time ever that I can remember. And I'm not even getting in it today. That's the, that's the whole bummer. Because uh, we got godly dads here that are going to help. And I think that's something worth celebrating. Amen? So in other words, baptism is an outward evidence of what happened inside of you. It you get baptized that day as an outward sign of what's already happened in you. You believe in Jesus, there's an internal transformation that takes place in you, and then you get baptized in water as a, representative, as a representation of washing that sin away. Amen? 
So again, I'm reminding you, we are led by the Spirit, not ordinances, but some ordinances are Spirit-led. And if Jesus said it, we can assume the Holy Ghost agrees. Amen? Amen. And we can assume the Father. We don't, we don't have to assume. We know. We can know the Holy Ghost believes and the Father believes. So I want to say this again. There are people out there that teach you are not saved until you get baptized in water. That is not true. You are saved before you get baptized in water, and then the baptism in water confirms the work that has already been completed in you by Jesus. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So if a person says they are saved, and they absolutely refuse the clear command of Christ to be baptized, I struggle to believe that they've been changed. You cannot obey the Spirit and disobey Jesus. Amen? Amen? The second pattern of water baptism that we see throughout Scripture is that it's always by immersion. That is, the person goes under the water. I've already given you one example of the, uh, the eunuch and Philip both going under the water. We see many baptisms by John the Baptist where he takes them under the water. There are countless, countless examples. But I want to give you really the only example that matters, and that is the example of Jesus. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. It says, after his baptism, Jesus came up out of the water. The heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove. And then the next uh, verse says, and his father says, this is my son, in whom I am well pleased. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all there in one spot. All there working in one event. And that is the baptism of of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ didn't get baptized because he needed to be saved from his sins. See, what did he tell John the Baptist when, I mean, here's John the Baptist baptizing folks, and then walks Jesus. And he says, I want you to baptize me. And what's John's response? Oh, Lord, you should be baptizing me. And then, I don't know the other versions, I just remember the King James. He says, permit it to be so, thus to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus is saying, let me show these folks the example. Let me show these folks the example that needs to be followed. So if Jesus was immersed, I want to be immersed. And that's the pattern I want to follow. Now, we also have several other examples throughout Scripture. I've just given you two. The third thing. Always the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, or also known as the name of Jesus. Now, let me explain this because this is super controversial, okay? I'm not dogmatic about what you say over the pers per person that you baptize or that is getting baptized. What I am dogmatic about is who they place their faith in. And the thing is, I make both camps mad. I make the Jesus-only camp mad, and I make the Trinitarians mad. Because I say, by the authority of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you in Jesus' name. Because I want the Trinity to be recognized, Amen? I want, but I also, the disciples baptized in the name of Jesus. Amen. That is the scriptural pattern that was set. Jesus said, baptize. He didn't say baptize in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Son has a name. Amen. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen? So we need to remember the details of the word. Sometimes I just want to say, I baptize you in the name of Yahweh, Jesus, and the Comforter. That's their names. But for the sake of clarity, I acknowledge the Trinity and I baptize in Jesus' name. There ain't no getting to anything without Jesus. <laughs> the Holy Spirit can lead you to Jesus, but if you reject Jesus, that's where it stops. That's why when Thomas said, show me the Father, Jesus said, you see me? <laughs> You've seen the Father. You don't get to the Father without Jesus. And you don't get saved without the Father. You can't reject the Father and call yourself a child of God. So it seems to always immediately follow salvation. In other words, once the person gets saved, there is a commitment made to be baptized in water. Number two, it always is by immersion. The person goes down under the water. And I'm going to tell you why this is important as we get to a close. The third thing is it is always in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, also known as the name of Jesus. The fourth thing that I've noticed is a pattern in the scripture is location is not important. There is not this holy water that you have to get baptized in or it doesn't count. It seems wherever a person got saved, 
That's where they got baptized. Just like the, uh, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. He said, look, there's some water. Why can't I get baptized here? And Philip baptized him right then and there. So location does not matter. Amen? Wherever a person gets saved, if there's water nearby, they can get baptized. I believe it's okay to inform family and wait for a proper date, as I've said already. And then the fifth thing, which almost seems to kind of contradict the fourth thing, but it doesn't. Hear me out. Is baptisms are not intended to be private events. Okay, kids, I'm going to need you to help me out and listen, okay? We're almost done. I try to be quick for you. But this is important stuff. and we want everyone to be able to receive what God is teaching. It is an incredible honor to be a part of a church that lets the children sit in the sanctuary once a month. Amen? It's an incredible honor to see. There was a little girl that uh, when she was talking about it got the joy deep down in my soul and she was doing this thing that I thought I was going to do it with her and then I went down this far and said, nope. Um, <laughs> but she was just doing this thing where she would go down to basically her bottom, hit the ground, boom, and then she'd bounce right back up and it was like, wow. Um, she's really understanding what deep in my soul means and, and, and that's just incredible to see kids worshiping the Lord. But baptisms are typically not private. Jesus' baptism was public. So were the thousands, or 3,000 more specifically, that got saved on the day of Pentecost. Their baptisms were public. Now, this is where it gets a little interesting for me, because I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong to baptize someone at your pool at home. However, I do think that it is somewhat self-defeating. Because the purpose of baptism is to be a public declaration of a private confession. You can get saved in privacy. In your closet while you're praying or in the shower while you're, uh, you're cleaning up and worshiping God. God can save you anywhere, anytime, any place. But I do believe that baptism is intended to be a public thing. Yes. Now, why is it intended to be a public thing? Well, um, let, me, let me give you a few reasons why I believe this. I've already said this several times. One is a, is a public confession of a private decision. See, the Bible says that he who acknowledges me before man, I will acknowledge him before the Father. You can't get saved and then hide in the darkness and hope nobody figures it out. All right? Baptism is that coming public. Here I am. I gave my life to Jesus, and now I want everyone in the church to know about it. The second reason that I really think that uh, it, the scripture shows that baptisms are not intended to be private is because it encourages and excites everyone. There is something about seeing a new believer go down in that water and come back up. There is something that happens supernatural in that event, and the church needs to be a corporate part of that. There's an excitement. There's a joy. There's just something that goes on, and that's why I really encourage every one of you to stay for this baptismal service. I know I wish that we had one somewhere in here to where we could do it right during worship service. I think that'd be awesome, but that is just not the logistics that we have. We have to cross the parking lot, and we have to deal with it over there. And uh, I thank God we have a baptism. I thank God we don't have to break ice in the creek in the wintertime. Whoo, hallelujah. I want to get baptized. You want to wait. Is that what you said? And Pastor, I want you to do it. You said your daddy, right? You want your daddy to do it, right? <laughs> thank God we don't have that hill to climb. So first, it's a public confession of faith due to a private decision. It encourages and incites everyone. And then this, Jesus didn't give the command to be baptized to, peop to a person. He gave it to a church. 500 people to be exact. He gave it to the church he had just released to disciple, to teach, and to equip people to obey all that he commanded. Just like it doesn't make sense to take discipleship away from the church, it doesn't take, make sense to take baptism away from the church either. Now, am I saying there cannot be discipleship that goes on at home? No, but it's a function of the church. It's a corporate responsibility. Because mom and dad, as great as we are, we can't give our children everything that they need. Amen. Amen. We need, just like a pastor can't give a congregation everything that it needs, a father cannot give their children everything they need. They need teachers. They need preachers. They need pastors. They need evangelists. They need it all, just like we do. Just like it doesn't make sense to eliminate those things from the church, it doesn't make sense to say, well, you know, we'll just do this private little baptism at home. And you may say, well, we did that, Pastor. Is that invalid? No. Again, I'm not dogmatic about these things. I am just showing you scriptural patterns that exist that I think it's a good idea to follow. Amen? So now that leads us to the question, okay, Pastor, we know kind of the patterns in the scripture of how baptism is supposed to be implemented. What in the world does it mean? 
Why do we do this thing anyhow? Well, let me take you to Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Now, he's obviously talking about grace in this context, and he's talking about how grace has the power to save us from sinning, not leave us in sin. That's a popular misteaching with grace, is that grace is the ability of me to do whatever I want and God will just forgive me. Well, Paul disagrees. Romans chapter 6 says, what? Should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Now listen, or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and we were buried with Christian baptism. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. So here is what I want you to do. I want you to envision that water as a grave. Because you have been transformed by the Holy Spirit. You are seeing that water as a grave. And when you go down into that grave, the old person dies. And is buried. And the person that comes up ain't the same person. Are you hearing me? The person that comes up ain't the same person. It's a brand new person. Outwardly acknowledging Jesus. That inward change that has already occurred is now acknowledged and celebrated by all. Colossians 2.12. I love this. It says, For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. So see, again, while communion represents what the sacrifice of Jesus was, baptism represents what the sacrifice of Christ did. It changed us. It transformed us. Why? Because all of us were born sinners. All of us were born incapable of making ourselves right with God. All of us were born with a nature to sin. All of us were born with an inability to stop on our own. We needed outside help from someone who was untouched by sin, who was holy, as we talked about earlier in the worship service, who was able to pull us out of that muck and transform us. And thank God he is able. Thank God he is able. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I love this. It's one of my favorite verses. It says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. So what does baptism mean? We know now the scriptural pattern. And we do it best to make it convenient for everyone by giving you a nice warm tub But it means something so much more. It means that when I go into that water, I've made a public declaration of faith that Jesus is Lord of my life, that I have been transformed, that the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, that I'm walking in obedience with the Son, and I'm walking in reconciliation with the Father. Now I have a relationship with the triune God that I could never have before because of what Jesus did, and that's why I participate in communion. That is why I eat his body and drink his blood, not literally, but metaphorically. We do not believe in transubstantiation here. We do not believe that it literally becomes the body and blood of Christ like so many of our brethren do in other faiths that I won't mention because I get in trouble every time I do. We are transformed. And baptism is a symbol of that transformation. You go down dry, you come up wet because there's been a change that cannot be undone. Are you hearing me? Now I want to share something real quickly before I close. Because baptism symbolizes that we belong to Jesus and that old sinful person died in that watery grave and is buried in that watery grave. And the person that came up is not the same person. It is now a person that is victorious and reconciled with the Father. But I want to show you the day I got baptized, if you'll put that up there. It was in August of 1995, and if you recognize that as my pastor, Pastor Carol, that you hear every Father's Day, looking quite a bit younger than he does now. Um, That was about 23 years ago. And let me tell you about this baptismal pool so you can know how blessed you are. Kevin Green did not only put a heater in that baptismal, but he scrubbed it yesterday to make sure the water was clean. No such thing happened in that pool. There was no heat, and that water looked like it had been in there for months. There was at least an inch of dust. It left footprints 
when you walked on the bottom of other people's body funk that had been baptized in that water. So you better believe I knew it was more than a ritual. I went down clean and got up dirty. But really, I went down dirty and got up clean. In Jesus' name. Which leads me to my conclusion. See, the man that went down in that water, before he gave his life to Jesus, was, was really, really unredeemable in people's eyes. I was 21 years old in that picture. I'm 44 now, a lot less hair, but a lot more faith. But God transformed me in such a way that there were things in my life that were vices that I could not get liberated from that dropped off of me. I got saved in July of 1995, and that was August of 1995. About one year later, I married my bride. And my wife, Beth, who was my girlfriend at the time, we had been sleeping together before that point, and we had been doing a lot of things that were wrong, and we stopped and made a commitment to God and said, now that we're saved, we're going to live for him. And we cut all that off. We got engaged. And then we waited a year, and we got married. It was a rough year. For you grown folk, know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, Lord, I couldn't wait for that year to end. It was a rough year. But God is good. And he got us through it, and the Spirit empowered, empowered us. But I am so thankful that the Holy Spirit of God one day in the middle of the west end of Louisville began to prick my heart because, see, I was living in utter and desperate sin. I was raised in the home of a drug dealer. My neighbors on both sides were drug dealers, and my neighbor across the street was the King Daddy drug dealer. And I'm not kidding. Um, we were in the middle of poverty in the west end of Portland. This dude had a sauna, a whirlpool. A he, uh, what do they call those hot pools? Hot, hot tub. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, they, they had an arcade inside their house. It was ridiculous. I mean, if you, you were a police officer and did not know these people were doing drugs, I don't know what in the world you were doing. <laughs> and it was like the Taj Mahal across the street and then all these little shotgun houses all surrounding it. I'm not even kidding. He had, he had a, uh, like a three-car garage. He had a basketball court. It was ridiculous. Uh, what's those things that, that the sauna? He had a, they had an outdoor sauna. All this stuff going on. And that, I grew up thinking all that was perfectly normal. And, and I was given my first beer when I was two years old. I was given whiskey in my bottle when I was a baby to put me to sleep. Probably not much older than this child here. And in my bottle would be a shot of whiskey so my parents could party all night. I learned to endure loud music. I learned to endure all these things. And I'll never forget, there was a pivotal point in my life when the enemy was tormenting me. I was a child probably no older than Joe, about Joe's age, maybe a tiny bit younger and I would hear voices inside of my head. And I'm, I'm serious. I would hear voices. It was, it was like people were living in my head. And I was too young to really articulate what was going on in my mind. And I remember telling my parents, there are people living inside of my head. This is the kind of stuff that was going on in my house. We had a, we had a, de a demon, a demon that lived in our house. And we named it George. How stupid is that? You cast those things out. You don't give them names. We named it George. He left butt prints in the chair. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I'm dead serious. Left butt prints in the chair. He would wake me up in the middle of the night and terrify me. And apparently he went and got seven buddies, more ugly than himself, and they decided we're going to take residence inside this little boy. And I would try to sleep at night, and I would hear them fighting, and I would hear them arguing, and I would hear them playing their music, and I was in torments. It was driving me crazy. And I went and I told my parents, there's somebody living inside my head. Now you imagine your child coming and telling you that. That right then should have changed their lives. But of course it didn't. They took me to the doctor, and the doctor kind of examined me and said, well, there's nothing medically wrong with him. And he told my dad something. And this is kind of off the subject, but, but bear with me. He told my dad something. He said, when you get home, I want you to tell it to leave. I don't know if this doctor was a believer or not. But my dad sat me down, and they called me Scotty back then. And he said, to the voices and the people living inside Scotty's head, this is his dad. I'll try to tell this dryad. This is his dad. And I'm telling you, you have to leave. And they left. They left. There's something about the office of the father. Even if the father is an unbeliever, when he speaks to something over his child's life, it changes 
that situation. Now, that's off the cuff. That is not necessarily the subject of today. But dads, you don't you dare fail to speak faith over your children. If you say, well, my faith's not big enough. My dad had no faith and those things left me. Are you hearing me? So then on, from then on out, you would have thought that we would have figured something out, but we didn't. We stayed in the drugs, and then my, my parents started giving me pot. And I'll never forget, and for the children that are here, look, this is real life. They had a black mirror in the, in the bedroom and had four lines on it, and I ran my finger through it, and I was about to lick it. My dad grabbed my hand, and he said, no, son, that's rat poison. And I'll never forget, I became a teenager, and I saw my friends doing it. And it was then I realized what was going on. Now, for some reason, my dad grabbing my hand and telling me, no, son, that's rat poison, always scared me away from cocaine. I never touched it. I was terrified of it. But I did acid. I did the marijuana. I did uh, the, 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 the pills and, and everything else that I could do. And I drank the alcohol, and I would get smashed and pass out throwing up. And it, was, it was a great time, so I was told. <laughs> and I got to the point to where I could not get free from these things. And then I met this beautiful girl. And her name was Beth. It's just to spoil the surprise already. <laughs> and I wanted to please her, but I could not. I tried to stop doing the drugs because it did not make her happy when I did these things. So I stopped 147,000 times probably doing drugs. And I would always find myself right back in the pit. I'd always find myself right back in trouble. And then one night, from my parents, believe it or not, I ate something called reefer brownies. Um, it's where they put marijuana and brownies, and it, whoo, I'm telling you, don't do it. Stupid. But anyhow, I ate those things, and it put me into a, what they call a trip. I'm just being raw this morning, real, because I, I got a feeling this is for somebody this morning. But I went into a trip and started freaking out. I honestly believe there was more than just marijuana in there, but I have no idea. But I started freaking out, and it freaked Beth out. And I remember for the first time in my life calling on the name of Jesus in faith. Because I was freaked out, and I thought I was going to die. And I said, if I can just go home and go to bed, I'm sure I'll wake up. But Beth wouldn't let me go home because she was scared. And then finally I said, Lord, Jesus... If you will get her to let me go home, I promise I'll go to bed and I'll never touch drugs again. And all of a sudden she said, why don't you just go on home and go lay down? I was like, it worked. Wow. So I went home and I went to bed and I went to my refrigerator because back then you kept marijuana in the crisper. And I threw it away. I got rid of all the drugs, but I kept one more vice. And that was alcohol. I could not get off the alcohol. Um, my family is a legacy of alcoholics, and I thank God that curse is broken over my family now in Jesus' name. Amen. So a few months passed, and the Lord was just dealing with me about it. Just the Holy Spirit was just really pressing on me. You need to give this stuff up. And then I started having dreams. I had dreams about the rapture. I didn't even know what the rapture was. I just saw these people going up in the sky, and I was like, what? I, didn't, I had never read the Bible. I didn't know what the rapture was. I saw people going, and I knew I wanted to go with them, and I wasn't. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute, what about me? And I also had some demonic dreams and some terrifying dreams. But the dream that got me on track is I was laying down. I fell asleep. And then all of a sudden, I'm standing outside, and it's the most interesting thing I've ever seen. I was running. I didn't know what I was running from, but I was running. And I got caught in a barbed wire fence. And when I got caught in the barbed wire fence, I broke myself free and fell on the ground, and my hands and my feet were pierced. And then all of a sudden, coals started falling from the sky and hit me in my back and burning my shirt. And I was just running with bleeding from my hands and my feet. I had no idea what any of this meant. And I make it to this building. It's this old, it almost looks like this old metal shack down here that we keep the lawnmower in. It's just beat up, but it was enough to shelter me from those coals. And then it started rumbling, kind of like the father as Dr. Norm was talking about. And a voice came from heaven, and it said, my son is about to return, and my wrath is about to come for those who don't serve him. And I woke up out of that dream, and I was like, I am done. There is, I am not staying like this anymore. And I started searching for churches. I went to the Baptist church. I went to the Catholic church. I went to any church that would let me in the door, trying to find answers. And then finally, I got mad, because I could not find the answers I was looking for. And I saw I got worse. 
And I started drinking again. And I started cussing like a sailor. And one of my friends would see me carrying a Bible because at that point I started carrying a Bible because I was desperate for answers. And my friend said, why are you carrying a Bible around and cussing? And I said, because I can't find anything that looks like this. And he says, I know a place. Forgive me for lingering. I know a place. And we caught the bus because back then I was too broke to drive. We caught the bus to church, Beth and I. And we went to that church. The first experience wasn't so good. I'm not going to get into that. But the pastor came and visited me, and he said, I want you to come back. I want you to try one more time. And there was a guy with a mullet, not even kidding, preaching. <laughs> and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He preached about how the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sins. He preached about how the Holy Spirit comes in and lives inside of us as a comforter and transforms us from the inside out. And I said, that's it. That's the message I've been looking for. And I went to the altar, and he prayed for me. And my life from that day was transformed. The alcohol was gone. The desire, because see, something happened. I quit doing the drugs because I promised God, and I was not stupid enough to disobey God in that way and make a promise and then back down on it. But I wanted it. Matter of fact, one time somebody handed me the bag, and I was so messed up on this stuff, I grabbed the bag and took a mouthful of it and just chewed it up and spit it out, just hoping to get the taste again. And uh, long story short, I was set free. I went home, threw away all my magazines, if you grown folk know what I mean. I threw away all my stuff that I felt would hinder my relationship with God, and I immediately scheduled my baptism in water, which is that day. And the man that you see in that picture, folks, <laughs> he's not the same man I just described to you. I have been transformed in a way like I can't even imagine. A year later, I was in ministry. had no idea what I was doing. But God used me. And God began to grow me, and he began to transform me. So I'm here to tell you this morning, the gospel of Jesus Christ still changes lives. The blood of Jesus still saves souls and cleanses people from sin. The power of God is still existent, even in the worst situations of a young boy who was given alcohol at two years old, given beer at four years old, had demons living inside of him at eight, nine, ten years old, had him cast out by an unbelieving father. What a miracle. Amen? stayed on this stuff, ended up on drugs, ended up doing all the wrong stuff, ended up a hot mess, and God saved him in an instant, just like that, transformed. I know many people's stories are different. Some people, they struggle to get off drugs. Now, my struggle, I guess, was all before I got saved, because the moment I got saved, I was done with that stuff. Since July of 1995, I have never even desired alcohol or drugs. I go to the bar to see my dad every Thanksgiving and every Christmas, and I do not even have the slightest of temptation to partake in what he's partaking in. What I do have is a heart to see him partake in what I'm partaking in. Amen. And one day I believe that's going to happen. Amen. Maybe some of you, you have loved ones that don't know Jesus, and you have loved ones that don't understand uh, what's going on in your life. Let's just continue to believe. Let's continue to pray, because remember the promise with a Philippian jailer, believe on Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved in your entire house. So Lord, I'm hanging on to that promise that Lord, you're not gonna give up on my dad. I'm hanging on to that promise that Satan's not gonna get any of my kids, including the one that's not biologically mine that is apparently having some sort of a hell struggle right now. Delivered in Jesus' name. I'm gonna ask everybody to stand. Could I just get a little acoustic? Just a little acoustic. That would be great. Well, yeah, just, yeah, that'll work. Everybody, come on up. Since y'all are prepared. What is it? Go with it. Go with it. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worship team has something prepared, so. Praise God. I forgot that you, you and I had had that conversation earlier in the week. The thing I want to share with you this morning is if you are struggling with drugs, if you are struggling with alcohol, if you're struggling with demonic forces that are trying to command your mind, I am here to tell you the gospel of Jesus Christ is still effective today. The message of the gospel that Jesus was born of a virgin without the stain of original sin, who lived a sinless life, never ever made even the mistake, but lived that sinless life. 
He died a sinner's death to take our punishment and our death. And he rose on the third day. He, he sent the Holy Spirit as a comforter because he ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father right now making intercession for every one of you here this morning. And he's coming again. One day he's coming back, folks. Jesus didn't just leave us here in hopes. Jesus left us here with a plan. He's coming back to claim a bride, spotless and without wrinkle because of what Jesus did. Folks, we are not going to be perfect in this life, but we can be perfectly transformed by the Holy Spirit. And maybe some of you this morning, before we move into the baptismal service, maybe some of you this morning, you say, I need to surrender myself to Jesus. I need to give my life away and become a child of God. I need that same experience, Pastor Tim, that you had back in 1995. I need my life transformed. I need help. I'm struggling. And maybe I've been serving God and then I fall away. I've been serving God and then I fall away. I've been serving God and then I fall away. And I can't seem to get victory and I want somebody to pray with me. I want you to come. All eyes open, everybody looking. Yes, is there anybody else? Get some ministers to come and help me. I'm ready to be set free. I'm, folks, if I can do it, I am not extraordinary. There is nothing in me that's any different than anyone in this room. God saved me and transformed me, and you see the product of that. 23 years drug and alcohol free. 23 years of being absolutely transformed and changed, and the same thing can happen to you this morning, and this may be your moment. This may be your time. Because time is running out, folks. Jesus is coming soon, and he's collecting a bride that is pure. And the way to get pure is to do what's happening right here, right now. And that's confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. It's not complicated. If that's you, I want you to come. I am tired of the battle. I am tired of the struggle. Folks, if God can save a child that was given whiskey at two years old, he can save you. He can save you. He can transform you. I'm so thankful that he saved me. I'm so thankful that that man is different than the man I had to describe to you just a few minutes ago. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, there are some folks here that have a very different testimony than mine. There are some folks in here that have saved God, that have served God from the day they were children all the way until today, and I thank you. I thank you that you've done that. Folks, there is no benefit to getting off track. I can't imagine where I'd be today if I'd served God as a child. But I tell you what, I have no regrets. Every moment I've given to Jesus, I don't regret. I wish that I could get you to understand what happened inside of me. Maybe there's some of you that are listening online and maybe you just happened upon this because of the title or something or, or whatever. Maybe you're looking for church home. Or maybe you're looking for answers. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus saves all sinners. And I was a good one. But now I'm a good saint. And see, that's why it aggravates me when somebody says, well, I'm just a poor old sinner saved by grace. Because that does not describe you anymore. The man that got out of that water was not a sinner. The man that got out of that water was a saint. Just a few months before, I had a picture of that same, looked like that same man in a bar. So Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you that you're transforming lives. You're still saving souls. You're still setting people free. You're still saving sinners of whom I am chief. And Lord, you are still doing work in the lives of people. And again, I just wanna make one more call. Folks, this may be tough. This may be tough, but this is real. If you are struggling with alcohol or drugs, and I would throw nicotine in that category. Nicotine is, a, is, a, is classified medically as a drug. If that's a struggle you have in your life, God wants you free. God does not want you bound back and forth. One day free, the next day bound. One day free, the next day bound. He wants you free, free, 
free. That's why the Bible says, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. So one more time, I'm going to ask you to come. This represents you. I'm going to ask you to come. Hallelujah. Jesus. Well, with that said, I'm going to ask everyone to join me in this altar. We're going to say a prayer together. And then we're all going to go next door. And we're going to celebrate, I think it's five children that have given their life to Jesus and want to identify with him in water baptism. If you've never been baptized in water and you live close by, there's still time. The water's still in the tank. Go get your clothes. Or just, it's, it's warm enough, just go get wet and, and, and get in the car and drive home real fast and dry off. Oh man, it's such a privilege to be this guy now. I thank God that that old guy is dead. It's such an honor. To kind of finish the story, I told you my family always called me Scotty. When I got saved, I looked that word up and it meant a wanderer or a vagabond, someone who had lost their way. And if your name's Scotty, then don't, you know, don't, don't take this where it's not intended to go. All right, just, just hear, hear my story. And when I filled out my visitor card at church, Pastor Carroll was a stubborn man. And it asked for my first name, and I put Tim, but then I put Scott in parentheses, because that's what I wanted to be called. But he refused to do it. He called me by my first name. He said, Brother Tim, and I'm like, no, my name is Scott. Brother Tim, and I was like, okay, you can call me Brother Tim. Well, then it went to the whole church. Whole church started calling me Brother Tim. Then the next thing you know, my boss at work was calling me Tim. And I was like, what is with this Tim thing? So I looked it up in the Greek, and the word Timothy means to honor God. So God didn't just change my life, he changed my name, just like he changed Jacob's name from supplanter to prince. He changed me from vagabond to God honorer. I'm gonna do a brother boss with me. Tell you what. That is exciting. I'm going to ask you to send your right hand forward. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. Everything that you do, even the fruit of your womb, even your children are going to be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Do we know this one? Is this something we're familiar with? Can we sing this together just for a minute? I mean, the word, they'll probably need the words though. You've got to take me down, put the words up. Jesus. Just lift your hands. I see heaven invading this place. I see angels praising your holy name and I sing praises, I sing praises, give you honor, worthy Jesus. I see glory. I see glory falling in this place. I see help restored. I see hope restored, healing of all disease and I sing praises, I sing praises, give you honor, worthy Jesus. We give you praise in all of the honor, you are our God, the one we live for. We give you praise in all of the glory, God. We give you praise in all of Jesus, we give you 
you praise in all of the honor. You are our God, the one we live for. We give you praise in all of the glory, God. We give you praise in all of Before we dismiss, uh, tonight our home groups, we have two, one for the youth, it'll be at Pastor Ricardo's house, and the other one will be at mine and Beth's home. It really is our honor to open our home to you all as our church family. Um, it's always a, a fabulous time. We do hope to have a campfire tonight out in the backyard. It's supposed to be pretty nice weather. And uh, it, it, 109 Tommy Gray Court is our address. Um, if you want to come, it's also available, I think, uh, in the bulletin or, or out in the foyer there's some sheets Pastor Ricardo you just go up Lakewood and drive straight and um, you know you're pretty much there um, but there's something about home fellowships that I think are special about this church and I would really love to have each and every one of you to come tonight um, thank you Mike and Ashley for closing us out so beautifully what, what a great day amen. amen so children we want you to go get your ice cream and also everybody please make your way next door yes Bible study this Wednesday don't forget, we're going to do a treasure hunt. It's going to be awesome. And uh, it's going to be, I think, a four-week series. So we're really super excited about that. But don't forget, get the kids their ice cream. God bless you. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely.